Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Adrian Huang. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and this is how you become an orthopedic surgeon. In this video, I'm gonna tell you the top three things which I think really helped me achieve my dream of becoming an orthopedic surgeon. These are absolutely applicable to all the different specialties, so hopefully you can pick up something that will help you achieve your dream job as well. How long did it take? Well, more like 17 years. It sounds like a crazy long experience, and it is. But if you're dedicated to becoming a doctor, it is an absolutely incredible journey filled with amazing experiences. But that being said, there are three things that I think you need that will help you along the way. The first, hard work. The second, advocates and mentors. And the third, a horse you shoved up. Luck, I meant luck. You need luck. For me, this included four years of undergrad doing a Bachelor of Science degree at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec. After that, I came back home to Vancouver to catch up on some credits. During this time, I also worked a couple of jobs and did my MCAT prep courses. Then it was another five years of med school as an international medical graduate in Ireland, which I did at the University College Dublin. After that, I was very lucky to match back into the first round into my top choice of residency programs at the University of Ottawa, back home in Canada. And finally, it was two years of fellowship, the first in orthopedic trauma at the University of California, San Francisco, and the second in upper extremity at the Hand Upper Limb Center in London, Ontario. That's it. 17 easy years. I never knew I wanted to become a doctor until much later in life. So because of that, I was always a little bit behind in terms of my requirements, so I had to work really hard to catch up. For example, during my time at McGill, I didn't realize that I wanted to become a doctor until the last two years of my degree. So for the first couple of years, I slacked off a little bit and was off experimenting with different courses. So to make sure I had all the requirements, I actually did some of them twice. My gap year back in Vancouver was a terrible year. It was a year of uncertainty, it was a year of catching up, and it was a year of hoping that everything I did was enough to allow me to achieve my dream of becoming a doctor. I worked really hard that one year and did everything I could to make sure that I was getting into med school. I was back in college doing my English requirements because I hadn't done them when I was at McGill. I was taking an MCAT prep course to make sure I aced the MCATs, and I was working two jobs, one as a busboy in an amazing restaurant called Chipino's. you gotta try it when you're in Vancouver, and the second was as a bank teller at CIBC. During this time, I had awesome mentors and advocates. My dad was an amazing mentor. I never felt pressure from anyone in my family, except for my grandparents, to go into medicine. But when my dad found out that's what I wanted to do, he really did everything he could to guide me in the right direction. The people at both my jobs also knew what my goals were and they were also super supportive in terms of working a schedule with me so I could study most of the day before coming to work or at least have some days off in order to study. And I was really lucky to have found alternative options such as studying overseas, either in the Caribbean or in Ireland or Australia. Everything I did during my gap year absolutely paid off and I did everything I needed to do to get into medical school. I got straight A's on all my courses and I scored in the 94th percentile of my MCATs. Unfortunately, after spending thousands of dollars applying to Canadian and American medical schools as well as international ones, the only interviews I got were from ones in Ireland and I barely knew anything about them but I thought I'd go anyways because you know, what do I have to lose? Unfortunately, I was not prepared, and I didn't even know you had to prepare for an interview. I thought you just had a chat. I didn't realize there were standardized questions that you could basically hash out beforehand. So I absolutely bombed my first interview. It was terrible, and I knew that, and I had this terrible sinking feeling coming out of it. At this point, I had essentially given up all hope that I was going to get into medicine. Fortunately, the other medical school that was considering me didn't have in-person interviews, so they were just considering my on-paper application. So one day, absolutely unexpectedly, I got the big envelope. And to anyone who's gone through the process, you know that bad news comes in small envelopes and good news comes in big envelopes. 
and I was absolutely over the moon and so excited to be starting my medical school journey. So here we are, headed to Dublin, Ireland. I had zero concept of where Ireland was. Honestly, I thought Ireland was part of the UK before I got there. So it was completely, completely foreign to me. It's hard to sum up Ireland because I had such an amazing experience there. And I would have to say it's probably the best five years that I've spent in my professional career. I had incredible experiences, I made amazing friends, and it's there that I really learned that balance of working hard, living well. As international medical graduates, we knew that we would have to go above and beyond to have any shot of doing residency back home in North America. Because of that, we really put our nose to the grindstones. I mean, there were times when we would be finishing clinicals from 7 a.m. to about 5 p.m., and then heading straight to the library, heading straight to the study rooms, and reviewing until 9 p.m. But at the same time, we learned how to live really well. We were very lucky that there were all these options for cheap travel, that there was a great pub culture out there, and added all those together, I mean, it made for some amazing times. During this time, it's incredibly important to have some great mentors and advocates. I was really lucky to have several of those, and so one of them was from Early on, I think in second year, she let me do a shadowing experience with her and ever since then had become an absolute advocate for me to come back into North America as a resident. Similarly, during my elective rotations in orthopedic surgery, I was able to work really hard and impress the right people to have these people then act as my advocates and vouch for me by writing me great reference letters and feeling calls when necessary. And again, I got really, really lucky. It just so happened that during one of my elective rotations back home in Canada, my preceptor was close and personal friends with the program director at my top choice. So not only did they write me an incredible reference letter, they personally made calls for me to vouch for me and advocate for me. So by the time the interviews came along, they knew everything about me and they knew who I was already. When it came to applying for residencies, especially as an international medical graduate, most people hedged their bets and applied for multiple specialties. But after all my experiences, I knew that there was nothing I wanted to do except to be an orthopedic surgeon. So I took a huge risk, but I followed my heart and I applied only for orthopedics. And at the end of the day, I got two interviews. I was incredibly nervous. I had two shots to get one of these six spots in orthopedic surgery that were available to international medical graduates that year out of almost 300 applicants. And when you go to these interviews and you meet these people who are your colleagues and your friends, but also your competitors, I mean, they are incredibly impressive. And that self-doubt absolutely starts to creep into your mind. But I remember I got into my interview and, you know, I just decided to be myself I had prepped for it, learning from my previous mistakes from my medical school applications and knew that I would do well. And like I said, luckily I did, you know, I was able to impress the people I need to impress. I said all the right things and I meant them, of course. But at the end of the day, I truly felt that I had done everything I could. And if I didn't get it, it wasn't because I had let myself down, but it was that truly somebody else was just better. And that's a pretty good feeling. So after interviews, it's the long wait. And I still remember the day that the match results come out and you log onto the computer and it's some crazy early or late time in the day because we're in Ireland and it's you know eight or nine hours ahead. So in the middle of the night, we're checking our results and sure enough, it said that I had matched orthopedic surgery. I was running around the house, yelling my face off, waking up all my roommates. <laughs> They're like, enough, Adrian, go to bed. We'll celebrate tomorrow. While med school was probably the most stressful part of my professional career prior to actually becoming an orthopedic surgeon, residency was the hardest. Essentially, residency is having a full-time job while being a full-time student. The hard work in residency just comes on by itself. I mean, you have to work hard to survive. I remember there are days where you look across at your colleagues in half day and the entire 
team of first years are asleep in the back row. You know, we're working easily and routinely 24 hour plus shifts. You know, my personal record was 34 hours without sleeping and that is not even touching some of my colleagues. There's a common adage in orthopedic surgery that says that everyone at some point thinks about quitting. But if you stick with it, it absolutely gets better. And I can vouch for that wholeheartedly, 100%. It gets better. In terms of residency, in addition to getting all the skills that you'll need, you also are trying to narrow down into your chosen subspecialty. And for me, I was really fortunate to have some great mentors in both trauma and upper extremity. I mean, don't get me wrong, the way you get them is by working hard, doing research and being a nice person. But at the end of the day, these are the people that are gonna help you get to the next step. Without a doubt, I wholeheartedly believe that it was these people that really played a huge role in me getting my chosen fellowships. I was really lucky to match bo into both my first choice of trauma fellowship, which is UCSF, and my first choice of upper extremity fellowship, which was the Hand and Upper Limb Center. Although I wasn't accepted into my first choice of fellowship the first year round, it was actually lucky it happened like this because the universe basically told me that I should do my trauma fellowship first, which eventually really prepared me for my second fellowship in upper extremity, which was much more elective, and I was able to get a lot more out of that. After five bitterly cold years this in Ottawa, crazy, we packed up I mean, and moved out west to sunny California. One of the best things about medicine is that it's given me the ability to move around and live in amazing places, and San Francisco was absolutely no different. My one year experience there was incredible and it was exactly the kind of trauma experience I was hoping for. High volume, high complexity, great mentors. The hard work that I put in during my next two fellowship years were much different than the hard work that was put in previously. In terms of the technical aspects of it, it was more about fine tuning and where the hard work really came in was understanding the academics of it, but also working hard to try to secure a job. I always knew that I wanted to work back in Canada. So when I was down in the United States, I made sure to keep all my connections open with all of my Canadian contacts. I flew back to Canada very often for all the big conferences to kind of keep networking. And I always kept in touch with them during the course of the year. All the while, I made sure that I was doing a really good job in my trauma fellowship, including pumping out research, teaching the residents, and just generally doing a good job in the operating room. I was really lucky because we had a lot of young surgeons who had just come back to UCSF and they were incredible mentors. We had an amazing time in the OR together and they continue to be excellent mentors for me now. In terms of networking, I think it's a really important part of trying to get a job that people don't often talk about. I made spreadsheets and documents and I looked up all the doctors where I thought there might be a job opportunity and would cold call them essentially and chat with them every chance I got just to keep them in the loop of what I was doing. These contacts went all the way back to when I was in fourth year residency doing my electives abroad. Um, they came from my fellowships, they came from conferences and people who I presented with. So any chance you get to talk to somebody was one that I took and one that I tried really hard to keep active. After a year in San Francisco, we packed up and moved right back to Ontario. My year at the Hand and Upper Limb Center in London, Ontario was without a doubt the best year of my medical training. I had amazing mentors, amazing colleagues, and incredible teaching in a pretty low stress environment. In terms of working hard, I absolutely showed up every day to the best of my abilities. Again, it's also about working smart. I knew that coming up, I would have to get a job in less than a year. So I picked up where I left off and went to all the major conferences, continued networking, and continued reaching out to the people that I created uh, contacts and connections with. Fortunately, throughout the course of the fellowship, I was able to pick up some amazing mentors and advocates that really, in my opinion, put me where I am now. You know, they talk about standing on the shoulders of giants and that's exactly what I think these two fellowships allowed me to do. Ultimately, I got extremely lucky and eventually landed my dream job back home in Vancouver, BC. It just so happened I was at the right place at the right time with the right people around me. A job posting went up that they were looking for a new upper extremity surgeon, so of course I applied for it. It just so happens that one of the senior partners there was a person that I had previously done an elective with. Another one of the partners was my senior resident in residency and we got along really well. 
And finally, two of the partners there graduated from the same fellowship that I was currently doing. So it made it easy for my current mentors to go to bat for me. So here we are 17 years after the start of my medical journey and I'm working my dream job in my dream city. Hopefully this shows you that it takes a lot of working hard and working smart. And with some great mentors and advocates and a little bit of luck, you can absolutely get to where you want to go and achieve all your goals.